Welcome back guys to Fort Might. Today we're going to be looking at another deck tech. So let me ask you guys this. Have you ever played Magic, Commander even, and you were sitting there playing and you were like, man, I really wish I could be playing Dungeons and Dragons right now. Well, this deck is for you. This is a Ferida Devil's Chosen Commander deck tech. Centered around rolling dice. Let's get into it. Let's open up with our commander herself, Ferida, Devil's Chosen. She's a legendary creature, Tiefling Warlock, for 4 mana, uh, red and blue, 3-3. Three, three. She comes with an ability called Dark One's Own Luck. Whenever you roll one or more dice, Ferida, Devil's Chosen, gains flying and menace until the end of turn. If any results rolled on the dice are 10 or higher, you draw a card. So, Ferda's all about having dice rolled and making sure you get the highest possible result with these cards. Now, I'm going to talk about all the, the creatures, artifacts, uh, spells, and lands in this deck. As you can see, it is, um, it is a red-blue deck, so it's going to be very much Spell Slinger. And uh, it's all about drawing into cards and getting the resources we need to finish out. Most times you're looking to win this game with uh, commander damage because whenever you roll a dice, she gains some sort of evasiveness in terms of flying and the ability to have menace. So your opponents would need to have um, two flyers on the field to even hope to stop her. Okay? Or two creatures with reach, now that I think about it. Or one flying and one reach. Anyway, that's not really something that they, unless their deck is built for, they're able to stop. We also have ways in the deck to just pump her up and make the commander damage lethal as soon as possible. Without further ado, let's start moving into the creatures. Opening up with our two drops. We don't have a lot of them, but they are mostly our most important cards. Let's kick it off with one of the key linchpins of this deck. Right here, the Pixie Guide. If you're going to play a dice deck like this one, you need Pixie Guide. It's a 2-mana 1-3 Flying Fairy. And it has an ability called Great uh, Grant and Advantage. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, you know Advantage is great. If you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. So if you have a card that lets you roll, let's actually take a look at the next card to talk about the Pixie Guide. Let's use our Arcane Invest Investigator as an example, who's also part of this deck, a two mana, two one elf wizard. Uh, it has an ability for six mana, roll one d20. On a roll of one to nine, draw a card. On a roll of 10 to 20, you look at the top three cards of your library and put one of them in your hand, the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. This is an okay effect, a little expensive to use, but it's nice to just have a activated ability that lets us uh, roll the dice a lot. So, Pixie Guide. We use this ability to roll a dice. Let's say we roll, buh, 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 what did I get? Ooh, a 14, that's not bad. Pixie Guide triggers and lets us roll it again. So we've rolled two dice now, right? Unfortunately, that's another 14. But that gives us double the chances of triggering his higher ability. And talking about Faraday, Devil's Chosen, whenever you roll more than one dice, if any of those results come up above a, a 10 or a 10 or higher, you're able to draw a card. So these guys work well in that you can activate this ability to draw and this gives us advantage to get extra dice rolls. Like I said, Pixie Guide is a requirement in this deck. Talking about going on into two drops, let's move into some other creatures that like when we draw. We're gonna go into the Brazen Dwarf. Whenever you roll one or more dice, Brazen Dwarf deals one damage to each opponent. So just a nice way to start pinging down your opponents just sitting there as you're playing this game, you're rolling a bunch of dice, and every time you roll one or more, you're dealing one damage to each opponent, so just constantly whittling them away. The last two drop we got isn't going to care about our dice draw, but is going to care about rolling a 10 or higher with the commander on the field. 
Fairy Vandal, 2 mana, 1, 2, Fairy Rogue, Flash, and Flying. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Fairy Vandal. This card is great because Faraday lets us draw whenever we roll at 10 or higher. So, so long as she's on the field and we're rolling 10 or higher, we almost always have a card draw uh, on board. And Fairy Vandal is going to get buffed because of it. Another Flying, um, hard to hard to deal with invasive creature because it's coming over your opponent's heads right so those are the three cards our three drops let's move or excuse me our two drops let's move on to some three drops moving on to the three drops another super important one the fey wild trickster three mana two two gnome warlock whenever you roll one or more dice create a one one blue fairy dragon creature token with flying this is allowing us to always have a board presence now. As we roll dice, we're getting tokens, blockers on the board, and just things that are going to constantly be annoying going over your opponent's head again. You're seeing a theme here. A lot more dice rolling, flying creatures, coming in with the Chaos Dragon. 3 mana, 4-4. Four, four. Chaos Dragon attacks each combat if able. It also has flying and haste. At the beginning of combat on your turn, each player rolls a d20. If one or more opponents had the highest result, Chaos Dragon can't attack those players or Planeswalkers they control. So this forces your opponent to roll a dice, but it also gives you the ability to roll more dice. Since you're granting yourself advantage with things like the, uh, the, um, the earlier mentioned card, the Pixie, you're probably going to win out on your opponent's dire rolls. But even if you're not, that just means Chaos Dragon itself can't attack. But your commander, who was getting uh, evasiveness in terms of flying and menace, because you rolled a dice, is going to still be able to attack. So Chaos Dragon is just another one of those enablers for your commander. Moving into the Iron Crag Pyromancer. 3 mana, 0, 4, Human Wizard. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, it deals 3 damage to any target. Looking at our commander again, we're going to be able dealing those damage, popping creatures, annoying things on your opponent's side of the field that just need to die. We're going to use the Iron Crag Pyromancer to take care of that. The last three drop we got in this deck is the Scion of Stiglia. Stig Stigia. There you go. It's a three mana, two, one, tiefling, shaman, flash, cone of cold. When it enters the battlefield, choose target creature and opponent controls, then roll a d20. If you roll a 1 to 9, tap that creature. 10 to 20, tap that creature, and it doesn't untap during your uh, your controller's, the its controller's next untap step. So it taps down an opponent's creature. Maybe he's getting ready to attack in with something real big. You flash in this creature. At worst, he won't be able to attack with it. At best, he wouldn't be able to attack with it for that turn and his next turn. So uh, the Skyon is definitely a useful uh, um, stopper of your opponent's uh, strong heavy hitters. Now that we're done with the three drops, let's look into four drops. As we move into four drops, we are getting into some of our more important creatures. These guys are pivotal. Similar to the, the uh, Pixie that was almost required in this deck i would also say this creature needs to be in this deck she was made for this deck we're going into deliana uh, deliana the wild mage a four mana three two now this one we gotta take a second to talk about she is an elf shaman legendary creature whenever she attacks choose target creature you control then roll a d20 on a 1 to 14, you create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of that creature, except it's not legendary. And it has exiled this creature at the end of combat, so it makes a token that can swing in with her, right? It's pretty good. She, she can make a copy of, your, of herself because the copy is not legendary, right? The second thing is... 15 to 20 you create one of those previously mentioned a tokens and then roll this again so we have potentially a game ender here with these two creatures on board 
Someone made a video earlier, I'll see if I can find it and link it in the description. But let me just briefly run through this. So you have uh, Pixie and Daliana on board, right? They're attacking in, swinging. She's gonna trigger. We're gonna make a copy of a Pixie. Well, when you make the copy of the Pixie, the Pixie's effect grants advantage. Now, unlike Dungeons and Dragons, you gain double advantage because you have two of these Pixies on board. What does that mean? Well, let me explain really quick if I can just get, yes, my copy. Okay? So, no matter what you roll, her first ability, at minimum, is going to trigger. Right? But if you rolled, say, like I just did, a 15 or higher, which is actually kind of easy to do because of the advantage. So long as you roll a 15 to 20, this thing is gonna snowball. 15 to 20, you make a copy of this and you roll again. You roll for her effect. You roll again because of this effect. And then you roll again because of the copy, right? Because the copy takes a trigger. So that means you are rolling one, two, three. You have three chances now to roll a 15 or higher, which then triggers again, right? Summoning a token and allowing you to roll again. You're now rolling for her effect, the pixie, the, t uh, the first copy, and the second copy. That is a one, two, three, four. You now have four chances to roll a 15 or 20, which those numbers are growing exponentially. I have seen it happen where just these two creatures attacking in become too much commander damage for or not commander excuse me too much damage that the game is ended here on turn five when i swung in with these two creatures if your opponents are sleeping on these creatures and you swing in and you get just a little bit of luck at least just in the beginning right you will completely demolish your opponent that you're swinging into and they won't have an ability to stop you. This card, fantastic. Unfortunately, after that first time, if you ever play again against those players, they're gonna immediately squash that card. So you need some sort of eva uh, evasion in your deck. Unfortunately, the one I'm running right now is a bit budget, so it doesn't have too much eva uh, evasion for her to survive. But this card, this card right here, is immediately one of the winners of the deck. You definitely 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 want to run her now it's tough to follow up a, a creature in the deck like that who do we use well we have the mad ratter a four mana one two goblin just a goblin whenever you draw your second card each turn you create not one but two black rats now these tokens are going to be great for blockers and they're just annoying swarm-based creatures that if your opponent isn't respecting them, you're going to have a stupidly high amount of them able to just start running over your opponent's creatures. Not running over in terms of trample, but just being too much for him to manage. He'll need a board wipe to deal with these rats. This is an excellent card because once again, our commander, whenever we roll a 10 or higher, is drawing us a card. Okay. Following up, another 4-drop, we have Chaos Channeler. This is a 4 mana, 4, 3, uh, human shaman. His effect is wild magic surge. Whenever Chaos Channeler attacks, roll a d20. On a 1 to 9, you exile the top card of your library and you can play it. On a 10 to 19, you exile the top 2 cards of your library and you can play them this turn. On a 20, you exile the top 3 cards of your library and you may play them this turn. This card is tough. It's another one of those hit or miss cards. I like it. In terms of it gives me more card advantage, but I actually most times would rather would prefer rolling low in the early game with this card because we might not have the mana to cast that top exiled card. And if we don't use it this turn, it's lost to us. So we want to actually be careful with Chaos Channeler. Moving on to Hordling Ogre. This guy works well with Chaos Channeler. 4 mana, 3-3. Three, three. Whenever it attacks, roll a d20. Create a treasure token on a 1 to 9. Create 2 treasure tokens on a 10 to 19. And create 3 treasure tokens if you roll a 20. A nat 20. So, 
the hoardling ogre gives us the resources we need to cast those cards exiled off the top with chaos channeler this guy can easily snowball us and make us uh or give us a stupid amount of mana that we can easily start using to to pop off with our spells we got two more creatures for the four drops we're going into the dingin windseeker four mana three three dingin or a genie i'm gonna call it a genie a gin there we go uh flying when the the wind seeker enters the battlefield you roll a d20 1 to 9 scry 1 10 to 19 scry 2 20 scry 3 nothing too big here right unfortunately there's only been one set that actually uses these rolls right or uses them effectively i hope that's going to change with the upcoming uh, battle for Baldur's gate expansion but Right now, we don't have too many options when it comes to rolling D20. So this isn't a great card, in my opinion. A little expensive for not a lot of buffs. Sure, it flies, but we're putting it in essentially just because we don't have a lot of uh, ways to draw a card. Or, excuse me, to roll dice. But I really like the Jin just as a placeholder for now. Hopefully, in the future, she would probably be one of the first cards I'm going to cut if we get more support for dice rolling. The last four drop is the clay golem a 4-4 four, four. this is this is not a d20 roll so this is going to be important let's talk about the clay golem he's a four mana four four golem for six mana you roll a d8 d8 and you make it monstr uh, monstrosity x where x is the result that's essentially means just put a bunch of counters on it when clay golem becomes monstrous destroy target permanent that's a great removal option. Six mana removal is not fantastic, but him on the board gives your opponent some pause, especially if you have six mana just floating, or excuse me, on your back row. They won't be able to play anything without you activating his effect and rolling a D8 to destroy maybe a creature that's entering the battlefield that you don't want to stay there. Here's the thing about him. You're rolling a D8. You will not be able to trigger your commander's effect off of that. At least the, the 10 or higher off of your commander's effect. So you won't be able to draw a card. Even if you roll highest. Even if you roll an 8, you still won't be able to draw off the commander's effect. But you will still be granting her flying and menace because it's a dice. She doesn't care what kind of dice. So long as you roll a dice, she gains flying and menace. But since the result will never be 10 or higher... You can't draw a card off of the clay golem, but he's still a built-in removal, and that's a great thing to have, right? So that's all the four drops. Let's move on to the heavier cards in the deck, or the heavier creature cards of the deck, and then we can start going into artifacts. Five drops. We have two cards to talk about, and they're not much to write home about. We have an Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, five mana, three, four, human elf, shaman, uh, psionic spells. When it enters the battlefield, choose target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard, then roll a d20. You may put that card on top of your library with a 1 to 9 rolled, or you may return that card to your hand with a 10 to 20 roll. We're using a lot of spells in this deck, so a, rate to, a way to recur the cards from the graveyard is great. Okay? I really like this card, but not much usefulness. Excuse the dog barking in the background. I don't know whose dog that is, but they need to come get their mutt. I love dogs, though. The last five drop we got is a goblin. Five mana, four, three goblin. When it enters the battlefield, roll a d20. On a one to nine, create a number of goblin. Create a one one goblin creature token. On a ten to nineteen, you create two. And on a natural twenty, you create three. Just more ways to swarm the board. Okay? So that's all the five drops. We're finishing off with the uh, six drops of the deck. That's the heaviest our creature base will go. Let's start moving into the the, the heavier creatures. Alrighty, back into it. Finishing off with our six drops. And first we're going to do the lightest of the three. And by lightest, I mean he's a 6-6 six, six for six. Elemental. When he enters the battlefield, roll a d20. On a 1 to 9, each player, that includes yourself by the way, sacrifices a permanent. Doesn't have to be a creature, just a permanent. On a 10 to 19, each opponent sacrifices a permanent. So it doesn't have to be you if you roll 10 to 19. And for a natural 20, each opponent sacrifices two permanents. 
This is just a good way to mess up, uh, to disrupt the board. If your opponents are pumping everything into one creature, this is a good stopper for that, right? And now we get into the last three creatures of the deck, the six drops. All of them, very important. They're all part of a, a winning, right? They're some of our strongest boys. Kicking it off with Niv-Mizzet, number one. Spoiler, we have both of them. Niv-Mizzet, the Firemind, a... Uh, six mana, four, four, dragon, wizard, with flying. Whenever you draw a card, Niv-Mizzet deals one damage to any target, and you can tap him to draw a card. This works well with your commander, because you're going to be drawing cards off of her effect when you roll dice, which means Niv-Mizzet is going to be popping the board or popping opponents just as the turns continue, right? An excellent card to come in, and kind of an obvious auto-include if you think about it. Talking into niv Mizzet number two, he cannot be countered. He is a six mana, five, five, dragon wizard. Flying, whenever you draw a card, niv Mizzet deals one damage to any target. And whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, a player, by the way, a player, that could be your opponents as well, you draw a card. So niv Mizzet just sitting around on the board is a scary, uh, this one, this niv Mizzet, is a scary presence just helping you pumping you your commanders helping him uh he is just popping off the last creature i, I call them the card draw uh boys because they all like when you draw a card we have the locust god six mana four four god whenever you draw a card with the locust god you create a one one blue red insect creature token with flying and haste for four mana, you draw a card and discard a card, and when he dies, instead return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. So, the Locust God, the last creature that loves the card draw, he is going to be creating a large huh, swarm of Locusts to overwhelm your opponent, right? You see there's there's a tie-in of just card draw in all of these, de of all of these cards, and uh, the biggest... Uh, contributing factor is your commander so that's all of the creatures in the deck not a lot of them now let's start talking into the artifacts really quick and then we'll go into the spells before I go into the artifacts I feel like I should briefly brush through the enchantments we don't have a lot of them but they're all really useful kicking it off barbarian class we really only need just the one, the level one of the Barbarian class. If you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the uh, lowest roll. This is another one of those um, win cards that we got. Obviously, if we break out Danitha, let me just do some quick thinking here. You cast Danitha, target herself, right? No, she wouldn't trigger because the, the, the thing is already uh, tapped and attacking. So it's in the process of attacking. So she won't be able to trigger off of the, the Barbarian class. She won't go infinite like the other, the, 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 um, the other uh, Pixies did. But the Barbarian class is still just a passive buff for the whole deck. If you would roll one or more dice, roll that many plus one. At his level 2, whenever you roll one or more dice, you buff something and give it menace. You know that buff is probably going on our commander, right? We want to buff it up. Whenever you roll one or more dice, so if you do multiple rolls in a turn before you attack, this commander is getting huge. It already, it's already going to gain menace just from uh, rolling, but still the extra attack could be lethal commander damage eventually. And the last level three, all your creatures you control gain haste. A nice, just passive buff to have on the board. Looking at the next enchantment, wizard class, right? If we have barbarians, we're going to rock wizards. I like thinking about this deck as a barbarian wizard hybrid. Anyway, the, the first thing is you have no maximum hand size. You're going to be drawing a lot of cards. 
I never get to the point where I have too many cards in my hand, just because I'm constantly slinging the spells all around. They never stay in my hand for long. But if you're ever in a situation where you're you're kind of aghast out and you just drew a bunch of cards, the wizard class is going to be nice to pr to protect your maximum hand size. At level two, we're going to draw two cards just at level two. That's a nice card advantage there. Level 3 is what we're aiming for on the wizard class. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on target creature you control. Whenever you draw, just at the start of your turn, if you cast a spell that draws, if an effect gives you a draw, you're putting a plus 1, plus 1 counter on a creature you control. You're buffing your board. This could be for the locust. This could be for the rats. This could be for your commander. This is an excellent level 3 that you want to work into as soon as possible. Looking at the next couple... We have a, uh, <laughs> a puzzle ward, right? Four mana. At the beginning of your upkeep, roll a d4. Scry x, uh, where x is the result. If you would roll a die's highest natural result, draw a card. This card does not trigger our commander, unfortunately, our commander's card draw. But the free dice roll at the start of your turn will always give your commander flying and menace. That's going to be fantastic. And it's passive effect of whenever you roll a die's highest result, just draw a card. This is going to be triggering, not very frequently unless you got that god tier luck, but just keeping it on the board is going to be fantastic and it will pay dividends in the future. Moving on, I just recently added this card, Improbable Alliance. For a blue and a red, whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 1-1 a blue fairy creature token with flying. I noticed I was drawing a lot, and so I have it set up so whenever you draw your second card, you're going to get more tokens on the board. I don't know if it's going to be very, this is a fresh, brand new include. I don't know how well it's going to be in the future, but Improbable Alliance is, is in theory... A fantastic addiction we can also use for six mana to just draw a card and discard a card which is always nice to fix any uh, problems we may be having in card draw we got two more enchantments let's go into maddening hex three mana enchant a player let's never enchant ourselves with this whenever the enchanted player casts a non-creature spell roll a d6 and maddening hex deals damage to that player equal to the result then attach Maddening Hex to another one of your opponents chosen at random. You could, in theory, start the game or cast this on yourself the first turn. Why would you do this? You're going to take damage. But you get a card draw whenever you cast a, a instant or sorcery. Right? Or, excuse me, you get a, a dice roll. You won't get a card draw, but you could give your commander menace and flying. Most times, I just put this on one opponent and just let it do work for me. Constantly ticking down your opponent as they're trying to cast spells to deal with issues. And it gives them something to focus their removal on, right? We have a lot of things that, that we kind of want to keep on the board. This Maddening Hex is just annoying enough on your opponent that he may focus one of his enchantment destruction uh, removal cards on removing it. Which means it's not being used on you, right? So Maddening Hex is a nice include. The last enchantment we got here... Confounding Conundrum. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card. That's great. And this one is another one of those, let's annoy our opponent and give him a target. I want him to remove this card, right? Spend his removal on this card so he doesn't use it on my other important things. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player had another land enter the battlefield under their control, they return a land they control to its owner's hand. So essentially, this stops ramp. If you are playing a rampant growth while this is on the field, then that land that enters the battlefield forces you to take another land back to your hand, right? So rampant growth is, is uh, or other ramp type cards are kind of stopped in their tracks with this enchantment. It's really annoying and it's going to be one of their targets. That free card draw for two mana is also appreciated. All of our cards enjoy that, right? So shout out to this card. I always want to try to keep it in the deck. Alright, looking through 
our enchantments. Let me get them in order for us. We have the soul ring, right? Obviously, soul ring does soul ring things. We have the talisman of creativity, some mana. Whenever you tap it for red or blue, deal one damage to yourself. You guys know that. We have the is it signet, right? We have the fire diamond, the sky diamond, the arcane signet, and the last one we have here, yes, is the thought mind vessel. Definitely, we want a maximum, no maximum hand size. I talked about this earlier. That's all of our our uh, mana rocks on uh, in total. Moving on, though, still not technically a mana rock, but the ever full purse. Two mana. For one mana, you can tap this and roll a d4. Create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. The player to the right gains control of this card. This is a fun card. This is like if you're not trying to try hard against your team or against your, your, your friends. This essentially lets everyone ramp a little bit. It helps you the most, though, because your commander is going to to uh, gain flying and menace off of its effect. And it also ramps us in terms of our spell sling, but it does help your opponent after you use it. At worst though, at worst, you're going to get a treasure that can be used for any color mana. At best though, this thing is going to pay for itself three times over by giving us four treasure tokens if we roll the highest result. So I really like it, even if we are playing a bit more of a quote unquote try hard I would still include this card moving on to another good card here Goblin Morningstar 2 mana uh, equipped creature gains plus 1 and has trample when it enters the battlefield roll a d20 on a 1 to 9 you create a goblin and on a 10 to 20 you equip that goblin with the Morningstar this is useful for your commander Sometimes your opponent will have two flying creatures in the hand in the air to on board to stop you from swinging in. Giving your commander trample is going to be one of those deciding factor cards. You can also equip it for two mana, a generic and a red. So Goblin Morningstar, pretty good. It's more of just to help our commander. Speaking of helping our commander, though, we have the Sword of Hours. I've seen this do work. Two mana, equipped, whenever equipped creature attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage, roll a d12. If the result is greater than the damage dealt, or the number is 12, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on that creature. Let's take a second. Let me. I don't want to take too much time, but I want to also make sure you guys understand how this works. Whenever it attacks, give it a plus one, plus one counter. No matter what, it'll always get it, right? When it hits the opponent, which is actually pretty easy thanks to our evasion of Flying and Menace, when it hits the opponent, we then roll a d12, right? Do I have a d12 here? No. Uh, do I? Yes, here's a d12. We roll a d12. Let's say in the example, I rolled an eight. The result is higher than her total power, which is four. So then, she would double the number of counters on her. Let's say she attacks again. She automatically gets one, right? And then I roll. Let's say if that result is 11, right? This time that result is 11. I dealt the damage. The result of my D12 roll is 11. That means she's going to double the number of counters on her, which means she's now six counters. Right, which means she's at nine power. This thing gets scary a lot, right? It gets scary real fast, and the Sword of Hours doesn't have to be just to your commander. Maybe you're swinging in with a Niv Mizzet or something else, or or even the um, not the Pixie, the uh, the Fairy Vandal that's getting plus one plus one counters when you draw your second card a turn. Right? Sword of Hours is doubling those counters on the Fairy Vandal. Really good card to have in this deck. Moving on to a treasure chest. This is a three mana artifact. For four mana, you can tap it and sacrifice it to roll a d20. You, if you roll a natural one, you kind of get messed up with this. You lose three life. 
If you roll a two to nine, you create five treasure tokens, which is the thing most people want to aim towards. If you roll a 10 to 19, you gain three life and draw three cards. But if you roll a natural 20, you could search your library for a card and put it into your hand. If that card you searched for was an artifact, it automatically goes on the battlefield, right? So treasure, uh, treasure chest is a random card. It might not always play out the way you want it to, but if we have ways to grant advantage, most times we're not going to get that natural one, right? I tend to always try to aim for the two to nine, but if you hit that natural 20, that's great too. Next artifact, component pouch. You could tap it to remove a component count counter and add two mana of different colors. This is technically a rock, but the reason I didn't put it with our rocks was because you can also tap it to roll a d20 and add some components. If you roll a 1 to 9, it only gives it one component. 10 to 20 gives us two components. So this is nice to roll dice. Moving on, we have the spiked trap. I like putting this on the board. It comes in, it has flash, but I always put it in for that one mana. Because I want my opponent to see what I have. I want them to know that there's a trap on board. And if and at any point, I can spend 5 mana to tap it. Sacrifice Spike Trap and choose a target creature. Then roll a d20. If you roll a 1 to 9, you deal 5 damage to that creature. If you roll a 10 to 20, it deals 5 damage and you get a treasure token. So it's a removal. Very expensive removal if you do the real math in your head. That's 6 mana removal potentially, right? If your opponent plays something that's 6 toughness, well, this isn't going to do jack to it. But it's a nice card to have on the board to be like, oh, who am I going to use this on? Oh, maybe you should remove it before you play anything. Once again, trying to bait out their removals on the more non-essential things to our deck. All right, we're moving on to the final three artifacts. They're all extremely useful. Ebony Fly. It enters the battlefield tapped. It's a two mana. It can be used as a rock, so you can just tap it for for uh, for um, colorless mana. But for four mana, you can instead roll a d6. And until the end of turn, you may have the Ebony Fly become an insect artifact with flying, where its attack and health is is X. Whenever Ebony Fly attacks, another target creature gains flying until the end of turn. Most of the cards in our deck already have flying, but this is nice to use on that ogre that attacks for treasure. Um, we usually use the fly as a mana rock and as a emergency dice roll if we want to give our commander the evasions. Okay? Next up, we have the deck of many things. This is one of our win cons in the deck. We don't really get the win con out as many times as we'd like, but it's still very useful. So, 5 mana, artifact. 2 mana, tap it, roll a d20, and subtract the number of cards in your hand. If the result is 0 or less than 0, you discard your whole hand. So you don't want to roll this with 21 cards in your hand. You will automatically have to discard your whole hand. You want to do this if you're running out of gas. If you have no more cards in your hand, you, you can't get a good dice roll off because, because your opponent's just stopping it whenever you, you get it. Or maybe you're just getting really bad rolls. If you have really low uh, numbers in your hand, this is going to be best. Especially if you have zero cards in your hand. For a 1 to 9, you return a card at random from your graveyard to your hand. For a 10 to 19, you draw two cards. So the 1 to 9 is pretty good. The 10 to 19 is good too, right? So we, we would be using those, not expecting to get 20. But if you ever have zero cards in your hand, you activate this effect, and you roll a natural 20, your opponent, one, one opponent is... In for a rough time. It allows you to reanimate a card from your opponent's graveyard under your control. And if that creature dies, whichever opponent owned that creature loses the game flat out. This is a great effect to have that almost like this is a hit it or quit it. We're going to throw everything we got on this one creature. So the deck of many things. 
we're most times using it for the the earlier effects, the first two rewards. We're never really going to get the third one, but we want to be careful when we use its effect because we don't want to subtract our hand down to zero. Okay, so deck of many things, pretty nice to have. The last artifact card, this one is my favorite actually. Six mana, Wizard's Spellbook. You tap it to exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, then roll a d20. You can only activate this effect as a sorcery, understandably, because it is pretty broken. On a 1 to 9, you copy the card that you, uh, you copy the, the exiled card's effect, and you may cast it. On a 10 to 19, you copy that card, and you may cast it by paying only one generic rather than paying its mana cost. So there are some expensive uh, instants and sorceries in this deck, and if we roll a 10 to 19, we can really just play those expensive cards for a generic mana. It doesn't even matter the color. For a 20, though, a natural 20, you copy each card exiled with Wizard Spellbook, and you may cast all of them if you want without paying their mana cost keeping this on the board is going to be scary for your opponent because you're going to be exiling spells all the time um from your deck from your graveyard and then if you ever hit that 20 all of those spells get cast in one shot this is a scary potential finisher card especially with the card draws and how your commander likes to card draw and the spells that allow us to roll dice to buff us up give us more card draw like this is going this is i wouldn't call it a win con but this is a fantastic this is like an auto include in the deck okay so that's the last artifact now we can finally talk about the meat and potatoes the spells and instants and sorceries Moving into the instants and sorceries. We have a good amount, so let's start banging through them. Opt. Scry one, draw one. Fantastic. You want it. Brainstorm. Draw three, then put two of those cards back on top of your library in any order. Great. Tormenting voice, right? We're going to discard a card from our hand, draw two, right? This is our card draw engine. The thrill of possibility. Discard a card. Draw two. You find some prisoners. Destroy target artifact or exile the top three cards of your opponent's library. And you can choose one of them. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card and spend mana as though it were mana of any color. You come up to a river. Right? Two mana. Uh, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. That's good if you need an ETB uh, bounce on maybe some of one of your creatures. Or find a crossing. Target creature gains plus one plus zero until the end of turn and can't be blocked. Let's say your opponent has a crap ton of flyers to stop your commander. Well, find a crossing gives your commander a way to just get through no matter what. Lose some focus. It's a counter spell. Um... Counter target spell unless it's controller plays two, and you can also replicate it to increase the cost of that counter, right? So if you say pay the two mana and then pay another uh, blue mana, your opponent would have to pay four in order to cast whatever spell you're trying to counter, which is a big tax on them. Is it charm? Another potential counter spell. It deals two damage to target creature or it allows you to draw two, discard two. Negate your counter, right? Counter non creature spell. Counter spell, it does counter spell things. You counter target spell. Cancel, counter target spell. You find the villain's lair, counter target spell, or draw two, then discard two. So that was a big counterspell engine in the deck. It's just to uh, stop your opponent's big board wipes, targeted removals, like, no, 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 you don't do any of that. I want to have my things on the board. Please don't stop them, okay? 
the last uh, instant spell here that I want to play, I have a bunch more instants, but one of the cheap, the last cheap card I want to put down and focus a little attention on, Critical Hit. Target creature gains double strike until the end of turn. Right? That's good for your commander. That's double the commander damage in one hit. But from then on, while this card is in your graveyard, whenever you roll a natural 20, that card comes back to your hand. So this is one of the few cards that you probably don't want to exile, but keeping it in your graveyard, if you ever roll a natural 20, allows you to bounce it back to your hand and allow you to, to use it again. Really good card. Chaos Warp. The owner of the target permanent shuffles it into his library, then reveals the top card of, your li of his library. If it's a permanent card, he or she puts it on the battlefield. There's a lot of discussion on this card, if it's actually top tier removal or not. I think it's pretty good. I like it. And sometimes I even use it on my own cards, because it allows me to just maybe get a permanent from the top of my deck and put it on the battlefield. Seize the Spoils. As an additional cost to this spell, discard a card, draw two cards, then create a treasure token. Berserker's Frenzy. Three mana. Cast this spell only before combat or during combat before the blockers are declared. Roll two d20s and ignore the lower roll. So you're rolling two dice in one shot this time. Remember, if any of those results are ten or higher, you're drawing a card, right? On a 1 to 14, you choose any number of creatures and they block this turn if they are able to. On a 15 to 20, you decide how your opponent is blocking your creatures. You want to hit the 15 to 20 and most times, since you're rolling a d20, you have a pretty high chance of rolling that 15 to 20 to make it so that you decide how your opponent is blocking. And then you could decide, your opponent, you're not going to block with any of your creatures and my commander is going to get through to hit you in the face. The Power of Persuasion. Three mana. Choose target creature and opponent controls, then roll a d20. One to nine, return it to its owner's hand. Ten to nineteen, its owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library. Or a twenty, gain control of it until the end of your next turn. I'm smiling as I read this card because this card actually beat me one time. I had a strong... Um, Corvald. I don't know if you guys saw my Corvald um, food tribal deck. I'll link it in the uh, in the YouTube video here. But if you guys remember that, it's pretty broken. It gets it gets really big, really scary. And this card stopped me right before I beat the I beat my opponent. He played it. He rolled this this dice and he hit the natural twenty, which took my Corvald away. And had him swing back at me for game, right? It was incredible. Like, the, the pop-off on this natural 20 roll immediately solidified Power of Persuasion as one of my favorite cards. Diviner's Portent. Roll a d20 and add the number of car and add the number of cards in your hand. If you have a lot of cards in your hand, this is gonna be pretty good. You uh, cast it for three plus X, right? So it's three mana minimum and an X, however more you want to put into it. On a 10 to 14, you draw the number of X cards, right? However mana extra you put into it. For a 15 or above, you scry X, then draw X, right? So this card allows you to decide exactly, because most times with a good, with even with, let's say, seven cards in your hand, you're probably, unless you roll real low, you're probably going to hit the 15 or above, right? Because you're rolling a d20. You're going to decide how you're getting these cards. You can scry the top number and put them in any order you want. Put any of that you don't like to the bottom of your deck. And then you draw X cards. Okay, so really good addition. We're going to contact the other planes. We have four mana. Roll a d20. Draw two cards on a 1 to 9, 10 to 19, scry 2, then draw two cards, and on a 20, scry 3, draw 3. Pretty good, just more card draw. Aether Spouts. This is a nice F you to your opponent if he's swinging in for game. For each attacking creature, its owner puts it to either the top or bottom of their library. Not even destroy them, just 
put him back in your deck. You'll do, you'll get them later. Okay. Arcane Endeavor. This is a seven mana spell. It's a sorcery. You roll two d8s and choose one result. You draw cards equal to that result. Then you may cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value less than or equal to the other result from your hand without paying its mana cost. So if you roll, let's say you roll two dice. One of them is an eight and the other is a three. You can decide how you split that up. You can either draw eight and cast a spell of three mana or less or draw three and then cast an instant or sorcery spell of eight mana or less from your hand. Okay, so this is really good, uh, a really good spell that gives you uh, double dice roll. You'll never hit above a 10 with this, unfortunately, but it gives you double dice roll and it lets you uh, cast for free from your hand. Reckless Endeavor, another one of those cards similar to, to Arcane Endeavor, right? Because they're both the Endeavors. You roll two D12s and choose one result. Reckless Endeavor deals damage equal to that result to each creature, then create a number of treasure tokens equal to the nut, the other result. This card is fantastic. This is a awesome board wipe. Let's say you roll two d12s. One of them is a 10 and the other is a 3. You can either deal 10 damage to the board and create three treasure tokens, or deal three damage to the board and create 10 treasure tokens. Like, yeah, really good. Just think about that. I like that card, one of my favorites. The last spell we got and the last non-land card in the deck, Ferda's Fireball. Five mana instant spell. This card deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker. Then you roll a d20. If you roll 1 to 9, it deals 2 damage to each player. And if you roll a 10 to 20, it deals 10 damage to each opponent. Or excuse me, oh goodness, not 10. Goodness, it deals 2 damage to each opponent. So it's either it's going to hit yourself, or it's going to hit your your uh, just your opponent. It'll hit you and everyone else, or just your opponents. But either way, this is a targeted removal because it's dealing 5 damage to the board. That's the last instant sorcery spell in the deck. That's the na that's the last non-land card, I think. Yes, let's go into the lands. Nearing the end here, let's talk about the lands. You got your command tower, of course. Your evolving wilds, terrapomorphic expanse. I have a ash barons here because I am poor, and this is the best mana fixing I got. Okay, uh, we have a cryptid caves. For one mana, tap it, and sacrificing it, you could draw a card. You can only activate it if you control five or more lands. This is an emergency card draw if maybe you need just a little more, right? We have a reliquary tower, of course, fixing our hand size, right? We want to fix our maximum hand. Under Dark Rift, five mana, tap it. Normally, it just taps for a colorist, but for five mana, tap it. It allows you to, add, to roll a d10. You can put an artifact, creature, or planeswalker into its owner's library just beneath the top X cards of that library, where X is the result. So if your opponent has something big, scary, or even an artifact that's really helping him win, you can use this land to get rid of that card, bury it into their library, depending on how high you rolled on the D10. But it's a nice targeted removal to a creature, an artifact, or even a planeswalker. Going into the colored lands now, we have a pain land, we have a highland lake, which, yeah, you know, uh, uh, come on, focus, 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 there you go, okay, it's focusing, alright, we have a tap land, it enters the battlefield tapped, a gate land, because once again, big pour, um, I'm probably gonna put another tap land here, because I like having... Uh, four dual lands uh, of the same color combination, obviously. But um, I'm probably going to remove one of these these basics here. Anyway, let's go into the basics. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve mountains. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 islands. Okay, so we have 12 mountains, 12 islands, finishing off our mana base. That is all the cards in the deck. Let's go into the final thoughts. So, final thoughts for Ferida Devil's Chosen. Here's the thing. Let's talk about it real quick. This deck can beat, not just stand up against, can beat a competitive EDH deck. A competitive commander deck, this deck is capable of beating. Not just beating, demolishing. Capable. It can also lose to the jankiest trash in existence. There is no in-between. Because it's entirely contingent on your dice rolls. As a... As a similar to any Dungeons and Dragons game. It is entirely contingent of uh, contingent on dice rolls. If you're getting bad luck today with these dice rolls, maybe the dice gods hate you and you're rolling low, nothing's happening. Like you are getting you are getting just demolished, right? And of course this is because you know, we we stack the deck as best as we could to to um, almost uh, uh, put the odds in our favor, but ultimately, if the dice aren't in our favor, we're not we're not winning. That being said, let's say you're on a hot streak. This deck, like I said, is crushing competitive decks, and I'm not saying that like Ugh, you're just saying that because you made the deck. No, I fought competitive EDH decks, like not even my own. I fought against other players in my playgroup who have and created competitive decks, and this has won out against them. This has beaten them, and they can't believe it, because sometimes it's like, oh, well, you fought hard, but you can only beat me if you roll that natural 20, and then the dice just gives you that natural 20, and you win, right? This deck is the best, most fun, most fun, frustrated most frustrating deck i've ever made and i love and i hate that i love it so much but it's great and everyone should play this and everyone's gonna have either a great or terrible time right it's just super duper duper fun don't build this deck i love it so much you should build this deck okay so, Ferida, Devil's Chosen, that was it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, obviously leave a qu leave a, a comment down below. On top of that, like, comment, subscribe. You know I love it. It, it helps stroke my ego, and it shows me that you guys want more of my uh, uh, EDH uh, or deck guides. Thanks so much for checking me out, and I'll talk to you next time.